harder challenges that we're all facing and that we all probably can improve on is, is how to tell a great data story. It's still some, an art that I think is, is finding its way, um, but you guys in particular as marketers, I think, deal with it on a daily basis, um, especially when it comes to those month-end kind of recaps. You're talking to your operators, your VPs, owners, and you're trying to explain why uh, you know, this property didn't seem to perform well and that property did, or you're you know, trying to explain why you need more budget for this property or why you think you might have actually be able to reallocate in another case, or why one marketing channel is working better than the next. So it's definitely um, you know a daily thing for you guys. So it made sense to us that we try and incorporate it uh, into today's summit. So hopefully there's all sorts of action items uh, built throughout this. And without further ado, what creates great data storytelling? Anybody know that? <laughs> um, so yeah, Princess Bride. Um, I'm going to just move quickly so we can hopefully catch up a little bit. Um, whoops. Can yeah. So, uh, yeah, I did a lot of research, tried to kind of boil it down, see where I saw the common denominators. I think what you'll see is a lot of this is stuff that you would use in just great storytelling, but then you'll see some separation on, you know, where it's really applicable just more on the data side of things. So it starts with a purpose. Um, not very good to get into a story and not really know why you're telling it. Um, then we get, we'll get into relevance. Obviously, you want to make sure that it's situationally, statistically relevant when it comes into data, and I'll get into each one of these sub-bullets. And then you need to have context, and that's another one that we think there's a lot of opportunity right now in this industry. We get people calling us all the time saying, um, I, you know, I'm not sure if this is, you know, something that is on your side, our side, but uh, we're really struggling with this property. Um, and they're looking for more context so that they can then, of course, communicate that back to an owner, to a VP, uh, to the appropriate stakeholders so that um, it feels like a more, I'll, I'll just say, impartial or, or fair kind of analysis of the situation. The arc is really, um, you know, no different than, you know, typical storytelling uh, where you have a beginning, you have kind of a midpoint, a climax, and an ending. Uh, the enrichment is something I think everybody, when they think do, uh, data story, telling they immediately jump to like the charts you know the visualization um, that's certainly a big part of enriching a data story uh, but there's more to it than that that we'll also cover um, that I think you guys will appreciate and then the delivery itself is probably uh, one of the hardest things that's really kind of the art behind it and uh, my dad always used to say uh, you can't put in what God left out so um, some of us are better storytellers than others but I think if you abide by some of these practices and keep these as kind of your tenants to, to walking people through data uh, that you can improve on your delivery uh, but there's definitely, um, uh, again, use David's term, squishy uh, parts to that. But uh, then, then comes the insight. So uh, this is probably the most in, important part of it, um, is what, what are you really gleaning from the data? What's the aha? Um, you got to be careful here uh, not to go too far with it. So it's really, you know, what are those macro insights? And then it's always fun to look at some of the micro ones that uh, may yield towards more data uh, storytelling or opportunities. Uh, and then the application. So we've said this is a big part of this whole summit is, is we want you guys to feel like what you're learning or hearing today are things that you can apply. And that's super important when it comes to data storytelling. Um, nothing's worse than getting in front of, you know, your C-suite stakeholders. You show them a bunch of data, then everybody looks at each other and it's like, you know, what the heck are we supposed to do? Um, so you want to have that application. So moving into purpose, um, mission impossible, that was the pun here. Um, it's really uh, typically these use cases. You know, you're looking to educate, um, and it could be like uh, sub, sub market climate. Um, you're looking to measure things. Uh, you know, just I'll, I'll get into some of the use cases. Uh, compare, validate, discover, evolve, um, or build a business case. And for me, like one of my purposes is I've found a new way to help get my daughters to asleep <laughs> when I go into the data storytelling. <laughs> That's funnier to me, but um, <laughs> all right. So uh, here's some examples, though. I'm just uh, not picking every one of those, but just a few for you guys to think about. So on the education, how does a huge increase in new construction affect, uh, affect cost per click on Google? You may or may not have ever asked yourself that, but those are the kinds of insights, things that um, are worth, I think, bringing up in some of these conversations as, uh, you know, again, some of your, your stakeholders or operators are questioning, why aren't things going as well in Charlotte as they were last year? And it's like, well, in fact, there's a lot more dilution because of all the new construction, and we've also seen an impact that that's having on the cost per click because it's gone up with all these new communities entering into the marketplace. On the compare side, uh, 
what, what's the difference uh, in ROAS, which stands for return on ad, ad spend, between gold and diamond packages on apartments.com? Many of you guys that have gotten to know us know this is, uh, I don't want to say near and dear to our heart, but something that we're looking super closely at and do have a lot of data on. Um, and this speaks more into kind of the long tail, short tail path that happens when it comes to the ILSs. Uh, you know, a lot of these diamond packages are meant, you know, to get those initial leads, but similar to long tail, short tail search, um, a lot of filtering advanced, you know, kind of, uh, well, advanced filtering happens before they really are getting down, you know, further into the phone funnel. If that's the case, then, you know, is a gold actually uh, uh, as valuable as a diamond? Uh, maybe, maybe not, and it's not kind of a general thing across the board, but it's some of the things that we're, we're looking at and comparing um, that you might build a data story around. And then the business case, ultimately uh, impact if we reduced our marketing budget during the peak season and increased during the slow season. David and I have talked about this example quite a bit outside of category, but um, the best comparison to this is like if you're a jeweler and it's Mother's Day, um, do you use your ad budget then when you know you're going to have extreme amount of demand or do you park that down the road where you know you're going to be up against it and it's a slower time of the season? And so those are the kinds of things that, that we also are thinking about that I think can create some really compelling data stories uh, you know, for your operators, for your stakeholders. You really want to have that compelling story, and these, I think, are some decent examples of some things maybe that you hadn't considered or questioned before um, or is going to ca uh, cause for a hot topic internally. But, uh, yeah, just some good examples. So relevance is really about the sniff test, um, and it really comes down to situational, s statistical, recency, and then fidelity is just meaning, like, how, how you know, lo or not loyal, but um, how pure is the data? And then is it actionable, and what is the business value? So a few examples here on the situational side, identifying appropriate comps. So this happens all the time. I think you guys have felt not victim to this, but you know, have been pushed on this where it's like, why are we comparing, you know, a lease up property to a stabilized property? Or we're comparing two stabilized properties, but they're totally in two different geographic reasons or, or geographic areas, or they're two different uh, types of assets. Well, this one's an A, this one's a B. So super important as you guys are telling those stories that you factored for this, and is it really a relevant story? Have you really considered these types of things before you uh, start uh, going through, you know, the data with people? Then actionable, over 64% of our calls, I think Melissa just kind of highlighted this, uh, were not answered last month by the leasing team. Is that something that you guys would see as actionable, not actionable? Uh, sometimes we hear that's just, that's not our problem. We send them the leads and then we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that they do what they're supposed to do, which is close. Um, but uh, if you think about it and you were able to improve like close ratio, which we talk about and you guys know this, that can have a huge impact. So hence highly relevant. And then uh, the business value uh, example here, increasing lead quality by 23% would save $250 thousand dollars across the portfolio so just mock numbers but these uh, I think are great you know good or great <laughs> relevant examples of how uh, you know data can be applied in the story so let's move on um, context so uh, KPIs, all you guys have different KPIs. We know that even by property. Um, you know, we often think in terms of conversions as marketers, but sometimes uh, those conversions can vary quite a bit from one property to the next. So it's important to know that uh, have appropriate context there. Uh, benchmarks, uh, super important. What is the norm? A, a lot of you guys have asked us that too, and sometimes we have to ask you, when it comes to this market, uh, these types of assets, uh, what kind of benchmarks should we be applying as we get ready to tell this tell this story? And then trends, of course, and a lot of that is going to be more time-based, um, but there's all sorts of other uh, kind of KPI you know, connections that you can make to trends. Um, that we can talk through, but uh, milestones, what does success look like? That's a big one, right? As you're telling a story, um, you need to know what success is. And in many cases, uh, I, I think the people on the other side, I'm not trying to point fingers, but um, operators don't always have a handle on that, on what success looks like from your chair. And so that's an important thing to have a handle on. And then the variables, of course, which there's a bunch out there that can impact how performance um, you know, is going at, at a various uh, properties, and then comparables, which I already kind of touched on when uh, when I was going to rel relevance. So examples, uh, I deliberately did this just to have a little fun acronym soup here. If anybody could get all these right, I'd be impressed outside of David. Um, but uh, KPI, so CPQL, that's more of a digital acronym. Um, the Q is quality. Uh, that's a big thing for us. Um, sometimes we come off as crusaders, but uh, it's, it's super important for us that we're driving quality leads, but then you have your ILS rank. Uh, 
uh, ORM, online reputation management, I'm just going to give you guys answers. CPC, cost per click, uh, click through rate, uh, time on site, and then search engine optimization. All of these can be different KPIs. You guys have t 10 more. I'm sure you could add up there. And then from the trend standpoint, uh, insert the KPI, but you often are going to look weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. How are things performing? And then on the variables, these are some things that we often see that aren't always factored for, which is what's happening when it comes to employment. It could be that you know big uh, you know new branches opened up or that unemployment is high, low, et cetera. Seasonality, I think you guys all know and deal with. It's one of the challenges when we, when we talk through budgeting. And then how competitive is it? climate and that's not always one that um, you know you have the best handle on um, some of you have more data than others but um, to get a good sense of that when you're going into a market what is it going to take um, you know from a spend level what does the ILS climate look like in that in that sub market and then of course close ratio So getting uh, into the arc, so this is just kind of that uh, meat and potatoes, if you will, the nucleus of any good you know, story. Um, again, beginning, midpoint, climax, and ending. Well, on the beginning, this is really where you are laying out that purpose, kind of the mission uh, behind the story that you're about to tell, then giving it the appropriate framing, which is going to be the context that we talked about, really the approach that you took with the data and then the relevance uh, behind the story that you're going to tell, and then obviously defining it, because a lot of people, when it comes to data, aren't always clear on the definitions, and that's often passed by, where it's like, did I actually you know, properly define the different data sets that I'm going to be talking about so you can clearly understand um, you know, what, the, what the important uh, elements are here. Moving into midpoint, um, to me, this is more about correlations. So this is kind of going through that process with the data, identifying cor correlations, trends, variables, outliers, uh, and predictors. Um, outliers, as, as Dr. Beaver was just saying, a lot of times you can just throw those out, but they, they can lead to some interesting insights that may have you start experimenting with other data to see if you can come to more conclusive, uh, you know, um, ideas. And then the predictors is something you, you guys know we prioritize quite a bit. You know, are there things that we're seeing that will help us better predict or forecast, you know, what a good marketing budget or mix would look like in any given property? Whoops. I didn't choose this image. Somebody, somebody else thought they'd have fun with this. Uh, uh, I shouldn't, like, I actually love it. Um, but anyways, uh, Climax. Um, this is going to be uh, the, the, the key findings um, and, and then the business value. Ultimately, like, what is this going to mean for your organization? And that's really important. Uh, you guys know when you talk to operators, C-suite, um, even as a team, it's like, how did this data affect our performance? Um, ultimately, is it going to make us more efficient? And then strategically, like, how are we going to pivot um, as we think through uh, the data and talk through the data? is pretty tricker aggie uh, so then the ending um, this is uh, all about the application and i think the best way to think about this for you guys is when we do get data back um, whether it's from your vendors your partners it's things that you've done internally what are you going to start doing um, differently uh, what are you going to or what are you going to start what are you going to stop and then ultimately what are you going to continue and if you can answer those three then uh, you know i think you've you've done a lot of the heavy lifting and then the dissemination it's like um, this is not easy especially i'll say when it comes to leasing teams and things like that that aren't accustomed to, to hearing these uh, types of stories uh, and data, how are you going to communicate that down to the organization? And then the implementation, which uh, is really just about the execution. So it's like we identified what we want to start doing, we know what we need to stop doing, and we know what we need to continue. Here's how we're going to communicate through the organization, and here's how we're going to implement it. And then what future opportunities uh, do you think that you can glean um, or that are in front of you as a result of, of the data you know, and the story that you told? So getting on uh, to enrichment, I thought this was kind of a fun uh, or a good example of how how Google does it, and it's not necessarily a data story, but I still think you guys will get it. But it has to do with personalization, visualization, and an emotional connection. Um, these are opportunities. Visualization, again, is where all of us, I think, kind of go. It's like, well, this is about PowerPoints, charts, you know, things like that. Um, but there is some really you know, unique opportunities that fall, I'd say, under the category of personalizing. And that has a lot to do with the audience that you're talking to. Uh, and then skipping to the bottom, the emotional connection. If you do research like, you know, what creates great storytelling, a lot of it is about emotional connection. And I think that's the hardest thing when it comes to data. It's like, how do I get people really leaning in, feeling compelled to, to talk through and listen to this story? Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples of, I think, how you can go about that. On the personalization side, though, integration 
integrating personal experience or anecdotes from the community. Um, that usually does pull people in where it's like, this isn't just data, this is people. Um, and you know, here's some of the things that we've been hearing from, from the field uh, or some things that you know, are personal anecdotes um, that you yourself might have had experience with to, to draw people in. On the visualization side, it's not rocket science, but I think there's more opportunities than off the shelf stuff. David's great at that. Um, you know, he, he always has a list handy if you guys are curious, like, well, how can we, you know, whip together an infograph, um, not necessarily outsource that, or, you know, what are ways to animate some of the data? Um, there's so many off-the-shelf technologies now that can help you guys do that and comes through really well when you're telling your story. And then on the emotional connection, I think things like referencing company goals. Uh, my experience for the last 15 years has been in management, um, senior management, and uh, I know how important that is, and I believe in it, you know, that, that your you know, company is aligned. And so as you're telling data stories, being able to connect that with the strategy of your company or, of course, the clients that you're working with, I think is a way to draw in and get more of an emotional connection. And then top competitors, uh, maybe not everybody, but a lot of us, I think, are pretty competitive. Um, so when you do start talking about some of the other maybe property management companies or some of the other assets that are near yours, um, that's something that also will draw people in. And then, of course, uh, whenever you bring up um, or get into resonant impact, uh, that's another one that, that has people leaning in. And then I just think property momentum. Everybody wants to know where the momentum is uh, as they're you know, going through a data story. So on the delivery side, uh, for me, you know, I think perspective is a big, big part of it. Um, you know, are you thinking multi-perspective? Not, of course, just for yourself, but for all the stakeholders involved as you're telling that story and then simplifying it, um, which isn't easy, but it's getting easier, I think, through a lot of these tools that we talk about, um, specifically on kind of the chart and visualization element of it. Uh, but uh, one thing to ask yourself, and it's easy for me because I actually have two, two uh twins that are in fourth grade, but you know, could a fourth grader understand that story? So sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, uh, I find myself tucking, tucking my girls <laughs> and uh, practicing on them. Um, and uh, I, I fail, but I succeed sometimes as well. Um, and that's when I know that uh, I, I'm appropriately telling that data story. Random injection. Um, and then economic, are you keeping things tight? And one of the ways to do that is you know, say I'm going to come up with three macro insights, um, and and that will make sure that you're kind of force ranking or prioritizing. Because when you do go through a lot of data, uh, you'll quickly lose people if you start taking all these detours and saying, "Hey, look at that trend. Look at that trend. Look at that trend." So really try and keep things tight. Um, be smart about that uh, as you're telling that story, and then staying cohesive. Um, and that gets a little bit back to the arc. But uh, again, you know, it's it's hard enough to keep people's attention with data. But if you're not really connecting the dots and filling out a story, uh, you're going to lose them. And then passion, and this may be one of the hardest ones. Um, you know, when it comes to data, uh, not everybody gets super excited. Uh, we know how important it is. Uh, this is where I think just having an opinion um, is what, what you should expect out of yourself or hope for. Uh, if, you, if you can demonstrate that you have some conviction and that uh, I think David's going to point out here too, uh, but taking a stance, um, that can win a lot of points. And it brings data more to life uh, if, you, if you're really expressing an opinion with some conviction. And then being impartial. Um, this one's hard sometimes because it's not always fun to tell the other side of the story, but there usually is one. So we may be winning here on the number of leads, uh, but at the same time, our cost per lead has gone way up. And so I think showing some level of vulnerability, um, both sides of the coin, is a big part of telling uh, good data stories. And it's also what's going to lend to better strategy down the road. So examples on the simplifying. Um, I teed this up just a little bit earlier, but converting Google Analytics into the proverbial Bernie, uh, buyer journey, awareness, consideration, and intent. I won't go too, down, uh, too far down this for the sake of time, but happy to you know, catch up with you guys afterwards. But David and I both kind of uh, glommed onto this one, as well as Nicole and her team, uh, to make it a little bit easier to talk through campaign performance. I think uh, you know it's half the equation when you look at the campaign data, but if you really want the full picture, you do need to bring on bring in guest card data, and you do need to bring in Google Analytics. And there's ways to like simply bucket using this kind of basic buyer journey, where you can look at different pages on your websites from galleries and amenities. I'm going to give you guys just a quick example here, but on the awareness, that's just to me the macro stats, right? It's like how many users did we have? Were our sessions up? Was it down? Our average session duration. Um, our bounce rate. Those are just macro statistics, but they help you like better communicate how the awareness of that property is. 
then you move into consideration. That's more where it's like they're past that point now, they're in floor plans, they're in amenities, they're in galleries, they're actually considering making a purchase with us. We now know this is not just about awareness, but that they've taken the next step. And then the intent is gonna be where it's like your location page. How many people are gonna click on a location page that already live there? So that's, that's one of the things that we run into sometimes with campaigns where it's like, well, this is a vendor, this is already a current resident, um, but location page is a great indicator of actually how things uh, are shaping up at the property. You have online application, you have scheduled tours, and that right there just helps tell a story, right? It's like, I need a better way to simplify Google Analytics for my operator so they actually understand how things are going. If you do it in those buckets, I think it's a, it's a lot more tangible for them. On the economic side, I already mentioned, keep, keep your insights to three or less. And then being impartial, uh, you know, leads were up 62% over prior month, but cost per acquisition increased 124. Insights, love this guy. Uh, I think there's a new one though, so, um, but he's a classic. Uh, macro, micro, deterministic, probabilistic, and bi business implications. So again, macro is going to be your top line. That's really where you should focus your story. Micro is where it can be fun, and it's like we also learned a couple of new things that uh, we want to share that we think we really should pursue perhaps next quarter. Deterministic, um, if you guys have heard that te terminology, that's where it's really conclusive. Um, and those in the data world use this all the time. It's like I firmly know based on like what we've done that this strategy is or is not working. And then probabilistic is is what it would seem. It's like this is this is more directional, uh, but we're not firmly you know convinced that this is uh, this is something that we should or shouldn't be pivoting on. And then ultimately the business implications is what everybody wants to know. So on the macro, uh, just giving you guys more real world examples. Properties with a, an ORM with a rating above 85 are generating 34% more prospects each month. On the micro side of this, hey, what we learned is our average rating on Google is two times higher than it is on apartments.com. Don't know exactly why, and that's one of those things that you would then use as maybe a jumping off point for, for, another, uh, for more analysis. But the business implication is what everyone is going to pay attention to. If we were in, in to increase our ORM to 85 across the portfolio, we can accelerate occupancy targets by an average of 12% per quarter. Everybody's doing end zone dances, you know, and that, that kind of stuff happens. There's a lot of these types of insights if you give yourself the time um, and you obviously uh, either have the right partners, the right resources that you can uncover these types of things and find huge savings or accelerate performance, which is, you know, at the end of the day, what I think everybody's focused on. So then the application. Um, I think this is where you have to ask yourself, uh, how transferable is this? Why am I telling this story if, if I can't really trans, uh, make this transferable to operators and to multiple properties, then it might not be the best story to be telling. Um, sometimes that's, that's needed where it's just you know, for one property, but as much as you can, you want to be finding stories, telling stories that you feel like have scalability. And then the optimization, um, that gets back to the start, stop, and continue, the implementation, and then, of course, the accountability. It's like, what's the follow-up? Um, how are we going to check in and make sure that we're you know, doing what we need to do to, to, uh, to take advantage of the data um, and the story that we told? So submarkets, again, example, submarkets dominated by ILS, ILS should decrease PPC, uh, PPC spend and increase social spend. This one we don't know yet, um, but I was just talking with Adam, um, who runs our, our paid media department, and uh, this was something we identified, I think it was in Florida, um, but that there was an enormous amount of ILS spend, I want to say it was in Boca Raton, on uh, the PPC. And you guys know, I mean, it's frustration point for many of you, the amount of money that they're spending in that space um, and sometimes on your own brands. And uh, what we identified was is that we were struggling to get impression share, which is critical, right? Uh, that we're falling underneath, I think, 10% on this one campaign. And so it was an uphill battle. At the same time, we were also running social on that campaign, and we saw a huge boost, way above normal uh, performance for, for the social campaign that we were running. So that could end up being highly transferable, where you know, with that portfolio or with more properties in Florida, if we identify that the ILS is dominating the PPC spin, that we would migrate budget over to social and pull back a little bit on PPC or switch to more of a long tail strategy. On the optimization, um, stop using amenities for social creative. Uh, you guys may have seen or heard this case study, but this is something we identified and we've already heard, I think again, it was uh, from Melissa just talking about how they go straight to the floor plan. 
Uh, but Megan, who's on Matt Adams' team, ran a really great study that showed us that uh, folks are way more inclined to, to click on floor plans or engage with floor plans in social media, specifically on Facebook, than they are with amenities. And it was deterministic, not probabilistic. It's, it's a no-brainer. Um, so this is something that's great as far as optimization and actionability. And then accountability, set monthly ILS rank lead ratio reports. This is one, again, of many, just an example, but are you measuring that right? now. Uh, we have an idea of, of where we sit when it comes to ILS rank, or you don't. Um, but then ultimately, how does that c compare with the leads, which gets us kind of back to like those more aggressive packages versus a more long tail approach to ILS, which is going to be your golds and your silvers and things like that. So uh, wrapping up here, these are the things I think just really basic questions that if you ask yourself, uh, you're going to become a better data storyteller. Um, if you address these and think about these before you make kind of those mini presentations, again, uh, prepare for, for an update with an owner. Who is my audience? I just answered that question, but, uh, and why should they really care about this story? So a lot of that's gonna get into the relevance and also properly setting the context. What's my objective, my ultimate purpose here? How will the data support that objective? And then what is the appropriate context? Because you can't just spray context. You really need to think through that and make sure that it's applicable to the people that you're talking to. Is the story statistically and situationally relevant? A lot of times we tell data stories, but they don't fit one or the other. Um, you know, we're comparing a stabilized with a lease up, or statistically we just don't have enough data to be telling that story. And then how can you enrich the story through personalization, visualization, audio, et cetera? What are the key insights, and how can I apply them in the real world? There's so much that data that we get that you can't actually apply in the real world. So again, what's really the benefit of that? And it hurts your credibility as a data storyteller if these are things that you can't really move forward with. And then ultimately, what is that go, f go forward? How will we hold ourselves accountable um, as a team You know, now that we've, we've gone through the process of, of getting this data and then ultimately telling the story? Exciting, right? <laughs> But this is something you guys hopefully know. We, we're super passionate about ourselves, but I feel like you guys are too, so we thought it would connect um, the amount of data that, that we're all kind of exposed to and that we're now like telling stories back and forth with. Um, hopefully some good guidelines for you guys to kind of think about as, as you're preparing to tell that next data story.